Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Roy Hattersmith, and I'm the president of this festival. Uh, it's a tradition of the festival, like all traditions of recent innovation, that um, I should choose the speakers for the first day, or at least invite the speakers to attend. Uh, this morning, the first of that group of people, we have a man of extraordinary wide variety of distinctions. Uh, he has made his name, and made the name of, uh, modern history, contemporary history, as he calls it. Uh, now I almost believe in the contradiction in terms. He has argued his case so persuasively. But as well as being a historian, he's many other things. He's a broadcaster, a new series starting in the summer. He's a member of the House of Lords, which he describes as a, as a um, laboratory in which he lives and works. He's also a distinguished writer of other sorts. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce Peter Hemmerson. festival with its own special tonic effect, which I always think is a blend of the spirit of place, this wonderful hall, great company, you, and brilliant organisation, okay, and the team. In fact, this year it's a double treat for me because I'm here, as Roy said, at his invitation, and Roy's been a friend of mine since I first met him 40 years ago when I was a young journalist on the Times Higher Education Supplement, and he was shadowing education for Labour. Though I fear one or two bits of my journalism might have strained that friendship a tap, but Roy has always been very forbearing towards me over these last four decades. The State of British Democracy. It's the kind of title for a talk that's almost guaranteed to stimulate from me, that is, a drizzle of complaint, a confluence of regrets, a litany of shortcomings. Well, as I may be about to deliver a dash of such drizzling in a moment, I'd like to get an antidote in first. Because at cuticle depth beneath my skin, I'm a romantic about Parliament, a genuine romantic, and the idea of representative democracy, particularly the form we seek to operate across our islands in the cold northern seas. I'm as one, for example, with a little known Churchillian eruption on the subject. Come with me now, briefly, to the House of Commons, late one night in March 1917, at a low point during the First World War. <coughs> The moment is captured in the diary of McCallum Scott, who's on his way home with his fellow Liberal MP, as he then was, Winston Churchill. And this is what McCallum Scott wrote. As we were leaving the house that night, he, that's Churchill, called me into the chamber to take a last look round. All was darkness, except a ring of faint light around the, under the gallery, all around. We could dimly see the table, but walls and roof were invisible. Look at it, he said. Look at it. This little place is what makes the difference between us and Germany. It is in virtue of this that we shall muddle through to success. And for lack of this, Germany's brilliant efficiency leads her to final destruction. This little room is the shrine of the world's liberties. <laughs> Wonderful stuff, glorious stuff, resonant and romantic. Now you might be thinking already that the poetry of Dartington is sapping what little analytical powers I possess these days, and that the swiftest visit in the flesh to the real 2013 House of Commons on a day of enhanced tribalism, if I can put it like that, would quickly put paid to all of that. Indeed, watching from the House of Commons gallery on Wednesday the 26th of June, which I think is just 10 days ago, in fact as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, unveiled the coalition spending plans, a metaphorical shadow fell over the chamber as Parliament's tribes bellowed at each other from their respective reservations on the green benches. And that was the shade of the general election of May 2015, which will take place one month after the planned cuts begin to bite. Now, naturally, all sides hope a substantial economic recovery will be gathering pace by then. For if it isn't, we really will be well on our way to a lost decade since the great collapse of 2008. Equally, all parties hope that improving output growth and economic optimism will play out in more seats for them in the 2015 to 20 Parliament, though the possibility of a second hung Parliament in succession I think is quite high. But for the well-being of the country, the road to 2015 needs, I think, to be a story of two recoveries, not one. The second of which is an aspect of my theme this morning growth of confidence in the parliamentary system. 
greater trust in parliamentarians themselves, and a stronger impulse towards individual participation, in terms not least of turning up to vote. Now here the indicators are not treasury projections, but figures published by the Hansard Society in its 2013 audit of political engagement, a compilation the Society has undertaken over the past 10 years. Now the 2013 audit's propensity to vote section is truly depressing. Only 41% now say that in the event of an immediate general election, they would be certain to vote, compared to 48% who said the same last year. The number of people certain to vote has now declined 17 percentage points in just two years, and is 10 percentage points lower than it was a decade ago. 20% of the population now say they're, quotes, absolutely certain not to vote, quote, close quotes, four percentage points higher than last year, and double the number who said the same in 58% are still not prepared to vote even when they feel strongly about it. Only 12% of the 18 to 24 year olds say they're absolutely certain to vote, a decline of 10 percentage points in a year and a decline from the 30% who said the same in 2011. Now, ladies and gentlemen, such data captures a seriously worrying level of political disengagement five years after the MP's expenses scandal erupted. It also carries more than a whiff of disdain for the British political class as a group of people. 30 years ago, the great economist J.K. Galbraith examined a previous surge of disengagement in the advanced and richest democracies. And he produced a theory, and the theory was that this was a factor created by a spreading of what he called a culture of contentment. Now, the argument being that growing affluence led to fewer and fewer voters regarding state choices about the levels of welfare as seriously impinging upon their individual and family well-being. In other words, you could privatise yourself away from state provision, unlike, say, the United States of the 1930s New Deal or the first ten years in Britain after the war. Now, the Galbraith theory also seemed to fit in the UK's falling levels of turnout of general elections, from the peak of over 80% of those entitled to vote turning out in the general elections of 1950-51. And I'll just give you the tariff I dug it out the other day of turnouts in the elections since I've been breathing on this earth. 1950 was the highest, 83.9%. 1951, 82.6%. 1955, 76.8%. 1959, 78.7%. 1964, 77.1%. 1976, 75.8%. 1970, 72%, which we thought was abnormally low. I remember that. 1974, first time February, 78.8%. 1974, October, 72.8%. 1979, big crunch election, 76%. 1983, 72%. 1987, 75%. 1992, 77. 1997, 71. And here's the plunge, 2001, 59.4%. Awfully low, dreadfully low. It crept up in 2005 to 61.4% and last time to 65.1%. But those figures do tell a story. Now, going back to the Galbraith argument, it carried the implication that should noticeably tougher economic times return, political engagement would probably rise. The Hansard Society audit suggests that that has not been the case since the crash of 2008 and the sputtering economic recovery thereafter. Perhaps part of the explanation lies in the culture of discontent, as one would call it, through which we're living. Because apart from a glorious six-week Olympics and Paralympics interlude last summer, I think we give the impression of being a people in a country determined to find things to fall out over rather than to fall in about. So that when times toughen and coarsen, we scapegoat those we don't care for, like the political class or the bankers, and withdraw still further into private, more atomized, more resentful in many ways, lives. Now, morale is a tricky word. It's an old-fashioned word that comes to mind. Social scientists don't like the idea of morale because you can't measure it. They lead really quite tough lives, social scientists, because if, if you only deal with things you can measure, pretty shriveled existence, isn't it? But we historians are different. We sweep it all up like some great man. Now, we know it matters too, even if it's new, beyond numerical calibration. 
We also tend to apply it to the military world quite naturally, but not always to civilian life. But that most gifted and inspiring of World War II generals, Field Marshal Bill Slim, touched on this in a broadcast on morale in the early post-war years. And he attempted to link the two, civil and military. Morale, he said, is not a matter of the fighting services only. True, an army without morale is nothing but a collection of unhappy, frightened men. But a nation without morale is just a collection of quarrelling, discontented sects and parties with no unity and no real aim. Now, I'm a great believer in party competition and a level of adversarialism, so I'm not daft about that. But I think the Bill Slim analysis does rather fit 2013 Britain. And if I was a party politician, which I'm not because I'm a crossbencher, I would be seriously worried by those Hansard Society figures and the resonance of the slim analysis. Now, what could be done about it? Very hard to answer. The answer for many in the politics business is to apply new technical enhancers to their jaded world. Use the social media, they say, as Barack Obama did. And that's the newly minted cliche of the political class over the last five or so years. And we imported another transatlantic wheeze, as you'll remember, in the run-up to the 2010 general election, the leadership debates. Even though they seem to have kindled a welcome flicker of extra interest in the 18 to 35 year olds, who were one of the least keen groups, the least keen group, to cast their ballot, I had and still have grave reservations about those debates. Partly it's because, as a historian, I live in the early post-war years. Just imagine, Roy, if in the 1951 election, we'd had leadership debates, Churchill up against Attlee. Churchill would have answered the first question in a great enthralling panorama that took 20 minutes, leaving room for no more. Mr. Attlee would have said, quite, or quite wrong, or perhaps. It would have been the most glorious thing to reconstruct. Roy did a wonderful film on Mr. Attlee and used a movie tone of Attlee coming in back into number 10 in 1950, uh, the front door, when he'd gone to see the king to ask for a dissolution. Anything to say about the election strategy? No. <laughs> what will the party be saying? Don't know. We're going to fix that at a meeting as soon as I can get away from here. Do you remember that? <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. I've never got that. But the problem with the debates, I don't know what you think, is that the structure of them and the nature of the celebrity driven impulses of media these days mean that to shine in leadership debates before a general election, you need above all the characteristics of a plausible tart. Now, being a plausible tart is about 10% of the requirement of being Prime Minister, no more, and it's not the most important bit. And my fear is that we'll be stuck with these leadership elections, that when parties choose leaders in the future, the plausible tartary will play too powerfully in their choice of leader, and therefore will rule out of being a Prime Minister, decent but non tarty and rather slow on their feet, people which I think will be an own goal of significant proportions. So I'm really rather worried about that. Gordon, of course, didn't fit that because he was chosen before those dates. I mean, I remember doing any questions before the, the debates had been announced and um, they hadn't happened. And I said, the Prime Minister, that David Cameron will do the boy wonder. Gordon will reduce it to a recitation of the Falkirk telephone directory, sort of the list of what they was done. <laughs> And Nick Clay will demonstrate the importance of being earnest. <laughs> and it was roughly like this, wasn't it? And also, suddenly Nick Clegg seemed to be terribly important in the scheme of things. And I have a theory about this. It's because a Prime Minister's questions, by the time they get to the Lib Dem leader, the place is in uproar, and they shout him down, and he never gets a look in. And people rather take him with this nice, thoughtful young man, even though he's terribly earnest. And as a result, there was this great spike in approval, as if somehow you've got a combination of Russell and Keynes on your hands, which for all his virtues we had not. But anyway, as you can see, it rather bothers me. But we are, I think, stuck with those leadership debates. But how can we kindle a deeper and more enduring interest in politics, amongst in particular those 18 to 35 year olds, especially those for whom politics and government are boring, plumbing at best, poetry never? Because that's really how the workload divides for the politician. Poetry and plumbing. I have a theory, I don't do theories very often, which may be, well be a touch fanciful, that in perception terms, they, like the rest of us, are suffering in that age group from a particular scarcity amidst a palpable surfeit. 
a surfeit of political coverage there is, but there is a scarcity within it. Now these thoughts have been triggered by a recent conversation with my friend Clive Soley, who's a very experienced Labour politician now in the House of Lords. And Clive has been wondering if a different kind of television treatment of politics is needed amidst the endless welter of political reporting and political interviews of the kind we currently have. Could it be that we need to provide context and flavour, a longer, wider sweep approach for our politics, how our political philosophies, our parliamentary and governing procedures and practices evolved over several centuries, presented by a political guide equivalent to Dr. Bronowski or Kenneth Clark when we were younger, in that great era 40 years ago of civilization and the ascent of man on the television. A David Attenborough for our political history, anthropology and sociology because we need somebody who can kindle a deeper, wider interest in all this and take us away from what George Orwell, George Orwell called the smelly little orthodoxies of politics. And am I being hopelessly romantic, even Pollyanna-ish again? Maybe, maybe not. If I'm not, something like this could be pulled off, I think, and the dividend just might be considerable and lasting because politics in our lifetime in this country, in terms of coverage, has never had its Clark or Bronowski or Carl Sagan. Perhaps now is the time. People haven't got the wherewithal to locate what we do now and how and why in the wider sweep. This wouldn't affect daily reporting, of course it would, but we, we need heavy duty programming on this, and we've never had it. Now, Roy, I suspect, before we take, take some questions and we discuss, would like me to finish closer to Earth with some swift thoughts about the House of Lords and its reform. A subject I think, I think we've always disagreed. Roy, I think, is an ended, not mended man, to use the words of Albert Victor Alexander, who is another great Sheffield Labour figure. Uh, I'm a mended man. I, um, I live in the world described rather unkindly. He was talking about the SDP, remember the SDP? Uh, Ralph Durandorf, a great German sociologist who loved this country and indeed ended up living with us. And he said, the SDP offers a better yesterday. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm a better yesterday man, and indeed a large proportion of politics, when you think about it, is a competition to offer a better yesterday. We want to cling on to the things that we like. We want to share away from the past the things we don't like. We want to cling on the good bits. And I'm very much in that tradition. And on Lord's reform, I am. Lord's reform has vexed us mightily over the past century and a bit. To mix metaphors, it's part Bermuda Triangle and part quantum mechanics. Now, the Bermuda Triangle bit is, every so often a generation tries to reform the Lord substantially, and they go into the Bermuda Triangle. Some people never come out. <laughs> Others reappear, singed round the edges, bemused and vowing only one thing, never to return. And then it goes quiet for another generation. But the quantum mechanics metaphor is, it's a thing of waves and particles. The big waves, we've had some of these, 1911, curbing the power of the Lords, can't block any financial legislation from the Commons, reducing their delaying power, bringing them down to a delaying power of two years. 1949, reducing that delaying power to effectively a year. 1958, the creation of life peerages, which changed the place cumulatively beyond recognition. 1999, getting rid of all but 92 of the hereditaries. That's a work of genius, the 1992 Act, because the only elected people in the House of Lords are the 92 hereditaries. <coughs> and we have a by-election at the moment, and when one dies, you see, you have to replace them um, with a by-election. When, when Labour loses a hereditary peer, the electorate, I think, stands at a mighty total of two people. <laughs> and when it's a Lib Dem, I think it's four. With the Conservatives, it's 47. So it's this wonderful outcome that no other country could have conceived of, let alone implemented, that only people who are there by blood are elected. I love it. <laughs> but now it's particles time again, because the, um, Mr Clegg's bill on the House of Lords reform fell last summer, when the House of Commons realised it was essentially about their powers, not the powers of the Lords, and they didn't want a, a largely elected rival even though the bill said the powers would be unchanged, everybody knows they wouldn't. The moment you got elected people in the Lords, proportional representation, huge constituencies, they'd push the existing powers of the Lords to the limit, and it would be a nightmare. And the House of Commons woke up to this and threw it out. So a big wave has just been expended. And Nick Clegg got very cross and said, if I can't have my bill, we're not having, how did he put it? Um, 
clever wheezes to make an illegitimate house more palatable. But now he's come round to the idea of some housekeeping reforms to stop our criminals coming back, to encourage more people to take retirement and so on. And it'll be tacked onto another bill next year. That's the idea. I'm not very happy about Lord's reform being tacked on as an afterthought to another bill. I believe in bespoke legislation. But we're on